So, Lauren, go, <laughs> this is just great. And I haven't, um, we haven't seen each other face to face in a while, but we've been in touch on Facebook. Will you tell everybody who you are and where you live? I mean, not like they don't know already, but. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Lauren Floyd and I live in Nashville, Tennessee, but I am from Clio, South Carolina. Which is right next door to my hometown, McCall, South Carolina. So, um, I, I have been so excited to do this because I have, I don't want to say I'm a fan, I'm just an admirer and a fan to, I guess you could say, <laughs> uh, of your work ever since we uh, did our show in the Marble Players, which we'll talk about in, in just a little bit. But um, the one reason I wanted to talk to you for RDU on stage is because of my connections here in the triangle with so many students and kids who are going off to school and so many of them go to your alma mater UNCG ah. and um you know they have the big aspirations of being famous and you know going off and making it on Broadway and I always make a point to say you can do your passion and not you know not be on that Broadway stage that you can do not you know you've had a lot of success so tell us about how you you know I know that you were raised uh with a music loving father uh who had his own band so can you tell us about your love of music how you got started oh my gosh um well I I <laughs> I can say that I remember always wanting to become a singer dancer. I mean, that I remember thinking that. And I started, gosh, probably dance at four years old. And um, the Bonnie Stillwell dancers, Stillwell. anybody is around <laughs> that area. Um, that was such a, such a great time. So I trained that. And I remember um, that I, I like to sing too. And my dad did have a band. <laughs> I remember being in school. Um, gosh, I was probably maybe it was even like 13 and 14 mm -hmm. and we would go around the, the area and play at some of the the lounges and the clubs and it was mainly like country and country rock and of course dad sang a little bit of everything too the first and, time um, I, the first time i ever remember hearing of your father yeah was my mother and them went to hear him play in dunbar yeah so, <laughs> so uh a lot of people would not, never know where dunbar was and heard of Marion Wright and he was very well known with his band and a great vocalist and he did a lot of stuff with the Marble Players you know yes yes and um and growing up I definitely you know getting the song and dance and and I was really lucky that mom and dad both supported what I did um I will say that I know that um definitely was a passion and and to think that I would do anything else in my mind was like no I'm gonna go and be a singer dancer and Honestly, I um I did start out in theme parks. There was one at Myrtle Beach, um, uh, Magic Harbor. That up, I oh no! <laughs> uh, just a moment. Um, <laughs> if I can figure out how to share a screen, this yeah. is some of your theme park work <laughs> when you um I went digging and I found all of these wonderful pictures from when you were working in theme parks. And I know you've done a lot of stuff around here, but you also went to England and worked. I did. I um, I kind of started, I did my theme park, gosh, I was only about 16 years old, I think, when I first started um, a summer job. And then I went to college, went to UNCG, and I got in the dance department. I decided to do um, a, a dance degree, um, a performance, like a BFA is what I graduated mm -hmm. with. I'm, I was going to, I dabbled a little bit with, um, you know, a, a BA, an educational background, but it just, I was performing a lot. I just got into the summer jobs at theme parks and I did go to, um, to England, Markham, England, and did a, a theme park over there. And uh, that was, it was awesome. And to come back, I, I did finish school. I took a couple of semesters <laughs> to do shows, uh, but I finally finished. Um, uh, school and that, that was it was awesome um do you think that the theme park work definitely helped along the way um I mean I know you you, you j not jumping ahead but you've done so much with choreography and that mm -hmm. experience with the theme parks doing all that variety of shows that definitely helped you down the line correct Absolutely. And honestly, being on the other side now, like, you know, I, I performed, I ended up coming to Nashville and performing in a, um, 
what used to be Opryland USA. And, and it was great because it was a, it was live shows and it was kind of the place to be um, in the nineties. <laughs> it's kind of when I, I was back there before it closed, you had such a melting pot of people and you had talent everywhere. But my thing was, is that, you know, I think sometimes theme parks get a bad rap. And I know it's been part of my mission because I was in theme park world and, and being in Nashville, uh, th there was a lot of everything I do now is probably from the people that I met in that community. Um, as far as uh, starting out on some, I don't know, other shows and things, but it really made me realize it's, you know, you really have to have a really great work ethic, which I, I did. I, I did get that from my, my family. <laughs> my dad was like, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to connect with the audience. And he just, he really, he instilled some things in me that I really carried with me. Um, so it was really important to me that, especially when I was on the other side and I'm casting shows and I'm doing a lot of choreography, that you get the right training as well, because theme parks got a bad rap, you know? They, uh, they do. And that's one reason I wanted to bring it up. But just very quickly, because your dad had such an, an influence on you, I want to share something very quickly. Uh, if I can, if I can bear, bear with me just a moment. <laughs> um, I'm not good at this sharing thing. So I want to share this clip that I'm glad I <laughs> so much i'm sorry it's still running um <laughs> the um the connection you had during that show and all those years seeing you and your father together in different things because i know y'all raised a lot of money to start the marlboro convention the the marlboro i want to civic say center. Civic, center, yeah. civic center and that was one of the concerts you did to help start the marlboro civic center and just seeing you know, I think every person wants a father who looks at them the way your father looked at you. And that's one thing Ooh, I always make me cry, Tim. I don't, I don't want to make you cry, but, you know, I, I know having said in the audiences and wa watching you perform, how proud he was of all the work that you were doing. So um, yeah. I, I, that, I just had to pull up that because I your father... He did a lot of work with Marvel players, and I remember the first song I ever heard him sing, which was actually the first song Jim ever heard me sing, was Who Can I Turn To? And I know he loved that song. So, um, you're, yeah, Who Can I Turn To is our song. You know, mm -hmm. so that's, you know, that's definitely, um, me and my daddy's song. I, I so, I, I so love seeing that though. I mean, that's such an important part of, um, obviously it's my dad and it's an important part of my life, but, it was, uh, you know, those times are very instrumental in what um, shapes you as a person, a performer. And especially, uh, and the thing that I keep telling the teenagers and stuff when they go out, because I see so many teenagers who want to perform and they don't have that support system. And I'm glad you're saying how important it is. And that's why um, the person who brought me and you together Joanne Bastion told me, and all that all that stuff that she taught me was, make sure you pay it forward. That's all I ask you is to pay it forward. And I try to do that every day. Um, I guess now is a good time to segue before we go into your singing and 
choreography and all of that in Nashville to uh, talk about how I became such a fan. And I'm just, <laughs> I will just, I'm just going to share this to start with and um, <laughs> just be what it's going to be. And this is when, okay, let me learn how to do this. This is, this is when I became such a fan. Why am I Sometimes there's times that things are meant to happen. I was I was so insecure uh, at that time doing Irene and knowing you had been off to school and that you were professionally trained intimidated me beyond recognition. And I think you knew it. I because I don't know I don't know if Joanne talked to you because no and you, and you probably don't remember this before I showed the clip because every I told everybody you were my first on stage kiss which you were and um <laughs> and mine <this> too <laughs> <laughs> okay um it, well that was not very good for you because it was a little peck and then the, the ending of the show was where the kiss was so good but um <laughs> the um uh, the thing the thing that this is a little self-indulgent for just a moment. Okay. I want to I, I want to say you never know, like you just said, you never know where the influence is going to come from. Mm -hmm. uh, you were so supportive of me during that time, and you gave me the confidence to go on and be a leading man. It's, it's it was my first leading role, and uh, I remember we went to your to your parents' house and we rehearsed and we rehearsed off from Joanne and, and, and you offered that to me and that was so gracious. But this is the, uh, before we get into your songwriting, this is the last thing I'll show and everyone can laugh later and all of this good stuff. But, um, the, bear with me y'all, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. This is, me and you uh, in that infamous scene. And oh, my first fight. Oh, excuse me. For a moment, I was carried away. Carried away? Just for a moment. But we don't want to get off on the wrong foot now, do we? You mean putting your arms around me is getting off on the wrong foot? It's so dare. Oh, sure. Putting your arms around me and kissing me. And we just an employee. Why, what would they say on Long Island? Oh, you can come back around here and get a girl like me back to your salon. But never put your arms around her. Never treat her like a human being. Miss O'Dare, are you aware that at times you can be positively maddening? Oh, I can, can I? Yes. If it's mad that you stand on my own two legs and not accept favors from some cold-hearted iceberg who finds it beneath him to touch me, then I'm proud of it. Miss Sojourner, I did not say that. What did you say? I was trying to tell you I... What did you say? Around you it seems increasingly impossible to know what one says <laughs> or what one doesn't say, Miss Sojourner. <laughs> There's nothing more exaggerating than an irrational female. <laughs> Very well. Miss O'Dare, you're welcome to stand on your own two legs indefinitely. Good afternoon. <laughs> that was, that was 
such a long time ago and it just brings back great memories it um, does it does i mean i we, uh wow i thought we did pretty good i was sitting there going man i should should have really kind of taken some acting lessons <laughs> i know i should have taken no. some way no i thought you did great <laughs> I thought you did great i um the, um the funny thing is is um and and i i'm so humbled for you to, to say that about um helping you feel you know like uh going out there and being a leading guy because i know that um i, I remember <laughs> having so many struggles backstage with myself. And that's why it's so funny when you said that, I was like, oh my gosh, it was, I think it was near the end of the, the last show. And I was, I could, I, I, something was going on with my voice. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember. remember, I just had this meltdown. And you know, and there, it was, it was like, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can go out there and do it. And so um, it's, it's funny, the things that, that we remember is you know, re a lot of insecurities as well. You know, and it's funny you said that. Do you remember what you told me? Because we had this thing. For those of you who don't know, Irene is an older musical mm -hmm. and it has those great shows like I'm Always Chasing Rainbows and You Made Me Love You. And that was our duet. And your voice was, I, I don't know if you were hoarse or what. I can't remember <laughs> that. But you told me, you said, when I squeeze your hands, join me. I, I remember, yes. and you squeezed them and I, I I mean that is people say what kind of actor do you want to work with that's the kind of actor you always want to work with that you got each other's back and I, I remember that it, I think it was the next to the last show or the last show last show I think and, yeah and you were vocal you were just vocally tired yeah 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 that's crazy right but I, I, hadn't it's thought, true. I hadn't I had not thought about that until you just brought that up. Wow. Yeah, I, that's that's crazy because I um, man, I still believe that I'm mm -hmm. all the time making. You've got to just support each other. You got to have your back. You know. Um, so cool. After uh, you know, you didn't do a lot of theater. I know you did theater in school because you did a chorus line. Yeah, you, you reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you did a chorus line in school. Did. Which is actually, one of my favorite shows. Um, and you definitely have to have the dancers to pull off a chorus line. Mm -hmm. But when you got to Opryland, I know that uh, a lot of stuff took off in Nashville for you. I know you sang back up for Brenda Lee for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and you and you sang for Louise Mandrell. And I know you choreographed some shows. Uh, I'm, I just talk about how that experience transferred over from vocal into choreography and, you know, how, how some of those, how it all evolved. Well, the one thing I do want, I mean, never say that you're just a singer or you're just a dancer or you're just an actor. I think it's still true today. You have to be all of that. And um, I remember... My first audition, like I, I'd been in shows where I was still singing and dancing. Um, and of course you can tell that my accent was real country. <laughs> I was just going like, ah, you know, I'm so country. And um, I actually in school did take um, a, a class and I kind of got this dialect out for a little while, um, but I didn't go into a lot of theater. And then being in Nashville, singing more country music, it just kind of stuck, right? Mm -hmm. But um, in saying that, when I auditioned um, for Opryland, I auditioned once and I think I auditioned as a dancer and I didn't make it. And the next year I went back and I said, I'm just gonna audition as a singer. And, um, and so I auditioned as a singer, but they put me in the dancer's call. And if I had for any reason not done the dancer's call, that would not have helped me. And so then it looked like, then I guess I, I guess I could do both. So it got me the part. And I, I, um, I always say that just, just always say yes and do it because you never know being on the other side now, especially casting. If someone refuses to do like, well, I can't dance. I won't do it. Then I know the work ethic. I mean, okay. it's as simple as that. You know, I'd rather see someone go and go, well, I'm maybe I'm not real flexible. Well, maybe in my show, I don't need you flexible. I just need to see how, you know, your skill level and see how you perform. And um, so that being said, I, I just think that's really important to know because I see a lot of people just going, well, you know, I don't do that and I don't do this. Well, give me what you do then. Everybody's got a unique thing that they bring, 
whether whether your skill is more acting, you know, or whether your skill is more song and dance, just do your thing, you know. So it's really important for me to to share with everybody because I think that's why I um I started doing more. You know, I just I didn't lock myself in. Um I learned my I lesson. That. Yeah. I love the fact that you talk about work at work ethic and you said a few moments ago about the connections you made in the theme parks helps you today. And mm -hmm. I and I, that's the work ethic and you never know who you're standing in front of and when that will come back. I mean, that, that is so important for me to tell these up and coming actors, singers, dancers, whoever is in entertainment that that's their dream. You always walk into a room from the time you walk into an audition, you never know who's, who's looking. And you know that from your job, you know, as a, core, a senior choreographer with your company now and the producer, you know that. Which, and you well, and it's really important that the minute you walk into a rehearsal, it's the same thing. Don't, I mean, you we really don't know the person beside you could be the next person that hires you in your career. You just don't know. And I think that um, that's just really important. Um, I remember that I, the first show that I got at Opryland was um, Brenda Lee starred in it. And for those who don't know who Brenda Lee is, she's a country legend. She wrote Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree was her big, big song. So you hear it every Christmas, <laughs> probably. And she's just such, um, she's, you know, just a, a, a dear, dear lady. But I remember um, at the time, when we would, when we started Opryland and you were, you had to audition for your songs. And so everybody sat in a circle and it went around kind of the room and you auditioned. And I remember, um, I don't even remember what I was saying, but whatever was in the show, you know, she's little mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, she stood up and she was like, who is that? And I was like, oh, Brenda Lee, you know? And from, from that, um, I ended up singing back up with her years later after that. And it's, it's you, you just never know. You know, you never know who's going to be in the room at that time, who's who's looking at you. Um, I always say confidence is quiet because you just, you don't know, you know, what's going on. Um, but I remember when I started working um, and got the gig with Toby Keith, when I went on tour with that, mm -hmm. I literally didn't know anyone. I was not connected to anyone in that camp of, of musicians mm -hmm. or singers. And I had done one gig that a friend of mine put me on a year earlier. And the piano player, um, they used a bunch of session, what you, call, you know, session people that have been out on the road with country artists. And um, this one guy played piano, um, knew um, uh, my, my friend now, Micah, who got me involved with that gig. He said, I need someone who sings and dances. And I remember getting a phone call and I was in an airport coming back from somewhere. I didn't even know her at the time. And she says, I heard about you from a friend of mine. And, um, you know, I can't tell you who the artist is, but can you audition? Mm -hmm. And I think my thing was like, you just never know. If I, if I had not even, you know, if I'd acted a certain way, you know, that was one gig. It was like two hours of my life. Um, and in that, time span I got that gig you know so mm -hmm. it's just really important to always and how, how long did you sing back up for Toby I was only out with Toby for about two years um mm -hmm. it was it was um, great the, um, <laughs> time that you were with Toby is that when you first it is that uh when you first met Joey was was yeah. through yeah. the Toby I I was, I was just I I didn't know how you met and I uh, knew he yeah. played guitar with Toby and I didn't wasn't sure if that's how you met um yeah. the uh going into the networking part and I'm doing this for the students and the kids out yeah. there who are watching um how important is the networking part of what you just talked about about going and taking a gig that you might not necessarily want is so important because you, again, you said you don't know who was sitting in the room. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, networking is important. I mean, you, you have to, um, 
you do have you do have to have a tough skin in this business, obviously. And you know, there are people that you feel like everything just went, ah, oh, you know, and they got everything, you know, in 24 hours. And I mean, I'm one of those that why can't anything happen? You know, who's to say? Um, well, you've heard me say you should have been CMA female vocalist several times in my eyes because. <laughs> hey, um, listen, I had CMA Entertainer of the Year I mean, since I was little. You know, um, you have goals. And even if they're not you have, there. You have been on the CMAs, though. But I was on the CMAs. I was yes. actually a dancer with Dwight Yoakam you know, on the CMAs. I was on the CMAs with, um, with Toby Keith. You know, I, I've gotten to do a, a lot of things. Um, uh, and it's so weird because I just don't ever talk about it. And I'm like, but now you're bringing back memories. I'm like, that was, that was really fun. That, was, that was my whole idea. I want them to see <laughs> what you can do. Uh, I remember, I remember standing up watching The Tonight Show when you were on there with Toby. I, I, I mean, I was, I'm that person. I yeah. can tell you things <laughs> that you probably have forgotten. So. <laughs> no, I haven't forgotten. I just, you know, you just... <laughs> You keep trying to, to move on and carry on. And um, yeah, I uh, I was thinking just the other day, I don't think, I, I don't know if I've ever really, have I ever been interviewed about this kind of thing, you know, because I start talking in circles and going, and my mind starts racing. I'm like, God, oh, remember that time? Remember that time? But mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it, it's good to think back. It's good to think back on the things that you've done. Um, it definitely helps you remember what you feel like your passion and purpose is. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely important. It's like when you're talking about networking, um, know who you are. Don't ever judge yourself um, as far as comparing yourself with other people. Mm -hmm. um, support people and, you know, learn from them. I think that's yeah. become a, a weird thing. I think in this business, everybody, um, and hey, I, I do it still, you know, you can get down on yourself, you can go, what, what's going on? Why haven't I got this gig? Or why? I mean, gosh, we're in a pandemic. So that's a whole nother story, right? But it really makes you think about, I mean, the arts in general are just, oh, it's just horrible that we are not out there doing what we love to do. Um, and obviously, that's just that's obvious. But as far as just keeping up what you do and working hard on you, but being nice, support of people, it comes back to you. It just does. And I think the way that you live your life, you know, it's, it's, um, and we'll probably get into it, but obviously when you start living and, and, <laughs> and a lot of life happens, um, you absolutely have to start checking where you are and where you've been. And sometimes um, looking back on all these, these memories of, of performing, that's a, that's a great thing. But mm -hmm. it's still because to me, you, you need to you support people and learn from them as well as knowing that you're an individual and that's okay. It's okay to be an individual and do what you and do. Just be, the one thing that I, I stress with people being a director mm -hmm. um, and you step behind the table in casting now is sometimes it, you just it, it's about the whole picture and how you cast a whole show. It's not about your individual talent. You can be probably, I think you could be one of the most talented people in a, that comes into an audition and not get cast for several reasons. And it's not your talent. It's, it's about the makeup of a show. And that is so hard to teach young people today. And it's... It, it and I know you know what I'm talking about because you go through casting uh, with your you know with the production company and we've all been there you know I, I definitely and I try to put myself there um, back sometimes because it is hard I know as a performer and there's there's always you never know the real reasons usually like if you didn't get the gig you didn't get the job you never really know but my thing is you just you can also turn it around for yourself. If you walk in and um, you're prepared or you're, you know, you can change my mind. You know, mm -hmm. if you really just show what you do, uh, I think that's, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> and also you're exactly right. The part you might be looking for one part. And unfortunately um, the day, you know, the next day two people leave a show that you're working on and then you need, two extra people and guess what 
you might have been the one that I was really looking at or our team was looking at, um, but I couldn't hire you for this particular role, but now you're perfect for the next role. For the next if you role. don't know, in 24 hours, and this happens to us all the time, you could be getting the call going, you know, I've had someone either drop out or whatever, and you're perfect for this role. The problem is if you walked out and felt like you had just, you know, I don't know, you felt like you didn't do well, or you walked out and the person maybe at the desk giving you the papers you needed to fill out and you make some comment, please know that all that gets back to us. <laughs> it just gets back to you. So it's the way you carry yourself the whole time. And everybody knows that things change so quickly. Mm -hmm. it, they can just change. And what people don't know is you have it, it, on several occasions said, Tim, we're getting ready to audition. If you know people who are out of school, send them my way. I mean, you have done that. And I want talent. I mean, <laughs> exactly. you know, talent. I work for, um, you know, a company called Matt Davenport Productions and we have been, I've been full time with them now 12 years, but um, the owner, Matt was my director at Opryland. And then I went on to do um, several shows um, for him and, and started doing choreography. Um, but within that, it's just crazy how we need to give, um, we have jobs to give a lot of times mm -hmm. and it's becoming that people are like, well, no, I'm kind of going to wait for that job. I'm kind of, that's fine. But when it comes back around, that might've been the perfect thing for you. You kind of have to remember that, you know? So I'm just saying, even if you know, you can't do something, um, if you know, you can't do something scheduling wise, <laughs> you know, talk to the casting people and go, I'm really not available right now, but I want to audition for you because there's, you know, things come up. And uh, we like to, you know, I personally want to work with a lot of talent, you know. I want to segue into your music and, oh, yeah. and, and your songwriting. I think your, your, you, your songwriting skills are just unbelievable to me. And yes, I'm a fan and people, and these are not just words coming from somebody who's an admirer. I just, I, I think uh, over the years, having heard some of your music early on i was telling you the other day about the cassette i can no longer play because i wore it out your first one that i bought and, <laughs> yeah and, can't, and i can't i mean i just can't get it so hopefully you know you can send me send me that that music um yeah like but, digitally <laughs> yeah i know um about three years ago you put out an album and i was bringing up the fact about joey your husband uh, that you met during um, Toby singing for Toby Keith, and unfortunately, um, Joey lost a lost a battle with cancer uh, in 2016, and I've got the year right. And then, as a, I think one of the things that I love is that you, uh, through your grief, you wrote a love letter as a CD. I, and I'm gonna let you talk about that about coping with your grief. Uh, when you did Make It Through Another Day, uh, the album, I, which has been my go-to a lot uh, in my times. And it's not, I, the one thing I want to tell people is it's not a sad CD. It's very inspirational, I think, um, when I listen to it. But if you would, you know, I want to talk a little bit about Joey. And I know there's a uh, the Joey Flo Floyd Foundation of what you just did for people during the time of the pandemic. So, um Let's talk about the songwriting and how you've gotten back into your music. Um, yes, definitely um, met Joey. He was an amazing musician and singer. He, mm -hmm. um, he worked for Toby Keith for a very long time. He also worked with Willie Nelson. I mean, he, he's done a lot of things and, and um, was, we, when he um, passed, obviously, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that time was, you know, you just, uh, you just, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like you, when someone gets sick, unfortunately, and you have to be with them through that, it's not like you don't know that that will happen, but then it's kind of like, it's always, you're not ready for that. And um, it just changes everything. I mean, you know, it changes, it's kind of like life happens and you just, everything that you knew is different. Um, you try to hold on to, you know, this particular time, I will say, cause you know, um, dad's been gone for about 12, 
years, I believe. It's going on 12 years, 11, 12 years. And um, I remember, and that was my first kind of like, oh, wow. Okay, here we go. The, the person that really said, you know, he gave me a lot of support and a lot of strength in what I did. And um, I was actually doing a, sh doing a show um, when I found out. And I was on the road and I, had, and I came home. And at that time too, you do, I think you just try to immerse yourself in what you know is familiar after a while. I mean, it shuts you down, you know, and Joey's thing just really did shut me down. But there was a way I'm like, the only thing I know is my music. You know, how do I get some kind of sense of where am I going and what my, what is normal? I mean, and all the things you hear are kind of true. What's the new normal? I mean, I don't know. I'm still living it, but that was my way of putting down my feelings in a way that I knew with music. So um, there had been some songs too that I had written earlier that he played on. So I kept them really basic. Like I'll, I'll be what is, or just be, I'll be, just be is one of the songs that um, we actually, I wrote and he's playing on it and we wrote it for a friend of ours that got married and I kept it on the album. I mean, just like it was. And then there was a, a duet that he sang on that he was um, producing a young artist called McKenna Faith and his vocals, they used his vocals. And so after he passed, I went to the, um, the engineer, the, the producer, and I said, I know you've got a track with his vocals. Can I put mine with his? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's just a lot of things that just, you know, it was a rough time, and, but it was healing. So my goal was to make that album come out um, on the first year anniversary of his passing. And um, yeah, so, you know, that's, it's what you do. I mean, music to me is, is healing. And I, I was at a point too, though, that I, just like in dance and any art and any craft, there are things that you learn. There's techniques that you learn. Um, even in songwriting, there's a lot of technique in crafting that you learn. At this particular album, I, I kind of just, no one really knew about it. And I just did it on my own. Like, I just wanted to write whatever I wrote. I just didn't want it to worry about if it if it was right technically, you know. So it's kind of raw. I mean, some of it has absolutely full production, but it's just kind of raw, you know. And I think that's the beauty of, of the whole album. Um, and then you included uh, Joey's song "My Life," and it's just it's absolutely it's just it's a beautiful piece. Um, the whole. Well, you know that song "My Life." Um, he did it was a demo of my good friend Rick Tiger, who I write a lot of my stuff mm -hmm. with. Um, and um, he had demoed that for Rick. And so I was like, can I use that song? Because it was so Joey. I mean, it, it was almost like he was talking about his life. So you're right. It's just, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, one of my favorite songs, and you know this is Blank Canvas, mm -hmm. um, that I go to a lot for me personally. Um, I love so that. I, I, I say thank you because, again, you don't know how many people that you have touched by writing that album. And um, I know that there's a lot of stuff that is coming up. Um, and I love the fact that you started Good Grief. Yeah. Um, about your, and that's your upcoming next project, your next album that it should be coming out soon, I hope. Yeah, um, the um, I, I I think it is ingenious that you took good grief that people associate with the peanuts and being a bad phrase, good grief, you know that kind of thing, and your spin on it is just ingenious. That you know it's it's good the grief that you've gone through has has given you some good. I, I think that's the way I took it, uh, watching the videos and hearing you explain the songs on on your um. Uh, on, on I want to say podcast, but it's not podcast, just on your live uh, feeds that you, mm -hmm. you've done. So yeah, if, it's, if you can talk about good grief, that would be great. You know, it's coming up on, um, it'll be actually five years that, that Joey passed in, in February and he passed on Valentine's Day. So, it, so I'm always like, okay, Valentine's Day is, um, was his way of, I mean, I take it now as love. At first I was like, how could you? <laughs> but um because, you know, it's just such a day, but it's such a, it's such a special, it's just got a different meaning now. And, um, and, you know, 
I keep saying all you take with you is love. I mean, and it's true. You don't take all the, the stuff that we grab, you know, and that's kind of like, you know, blank canvas kind of, kind of came to us because to me, you know, in everything, even, even going all the way back to like dance and stuff, I love a blank piece of paper and I love to see how all of a sudden you create something and there it is. You know, it's like when you create something from the ground up and you've taken, whether it's some um, original song, it's an original show, you get the music and everything starts on a blank page, you know? Yeah. And um, I definitely, gosh, good grief came to me. It was just in my head because I, I mean, you're going to have moments all the time, no matter what. I mean, Joy's going to always be part of my life. My dad's going to always be part of my life. Loss is unfortunately a part of life, life. but I, I didn't want to dwell in it so much. I mean, it's just it's bad enough, you know, that you go through it and you have to go through it. You have to let it process and everyone is different. Everyone. Um, but trying to find some of the good in the grief was really important to me, you know, um, because if I'm going to keep living, then I want to live the rest of my life doing something important or giving back or finding good, you know, and it's hard and look at what is going on in the world right now. It's hard. So I had already written about four or five new songs and timing wise was interesting because they were already being mixed and, um, finish it. We were already finishing up when the pandemic hit, like kind of March. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to start a little series. I, you know, and I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing <laughs> technically and all that sometimes, but I'm like, I'm just going to start it. And I'm honestly, out of all the performing and everything that I've been doing, the hardest thing for me was to get in front of a, my phone and talk about a story about why I wrote that song. And it mainly is because, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm so close, you know, but it, it's been healing because I think, um, I've been one to kind of keep things to myself. And the more that I feel like if I can help anyone feel anything or be inspired, anything, um, on a good side of something, then that's only helping me as well. And I hope it's helping them. And I've always liked to kind of know the stories behind the songs and why things were written. And, um, that's kind of where good grief came from. I, I've, I've got them on my Instagram and my Facebook and I'm still trying to set up the YouTube thing, <laughs> but um, I hope that good grief can turn into even more. I want to talk about, I want to talk to people and, and find out more about their grief and it doesn't have to be loss. It could be grief of a job, loss of a job. It could be anything. Um, and I've found that that's a, a new kind of purpose in my life. It's just to give back and to heal. And if music can do that, and we can do it through dance and we can do through all of all of the arts and that was my pathway into it you know yeah. i um think i've i've had a lot of over the years i've liked a lot of your numbers um the one that you wrote with david gibson the the, 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 the is it the lucky one the, isn't she lucky? oh my gosh yeah. um yeah. I, I love that song and I love blank canvas, but I do have a new favorite. Okay. Um, in that moment. Oh. It, um, and I know I saw the video of your celebration of Joey uh, in your in your apartment when you first wrote the song. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that is a gift that to be able to say in the, you know to come up with a song that de definitely speaks to what you go in through in a moment in an instance when something can just bring it right back is it is just ingenious um i found something you i think it, it had I, i'm pretty sure you said it it was on joey's uh foundation page and it was i and I, I think I think these words are are so profound. You is quote, grief does not define me, oh. nor does it compliment me, but it but it is my companion, assuring me that tears strengthen and love prevails. I mean, you're a writer, and that that's that just that's that's so profound, and it's it, I promise I'm not gonna make you cry, but. <laughs> you're you're given this you're given this gift to 
so many people and you don't know who who it's touching you. I mean, I go on there and I've been listening to In This Moment and there's somebody out there who is listening to this. And I'm not talking about watching me and you, I'm saying listening to your music. Yeah. And, you know, you just never know. And well, that, know. That's, that's just the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. Wow, Tim, that means so much. Oh my gosh, thank you. I, um, you know, it's it's been, it's tough. It's kind of like life makes you really think about where you're at and what, what you're doing. And, mm -hmm. and if you can grow and learn from it, I think that's really important because um, it's real easy just to give up. I mean, especially, it is. especially right now during the pandemic. And I worry yeah. about people in the arts and not being able to create. I mean, I've gone through, I don't want to say the stages of grief. I was panicked and then I got mad and scared. I mean, yes. you know, wh what do we do to keep the arts alive when I, this is going to be kind of mean? I'm not, I'm not anti-sports at all, but they're getting a taste of what the arts have been like all along. Uh, not not being able to play in school and things like that when the arts mm -hmm. are being shut down continuously and it, it's sad for you know those students or kids who, who out there who need the sports just as much as the kids who need the arts and uh, um it, it, it's just it's sad and that's what I worry about um what's going to happen to these kids who are just stuck and don't have a, a creative outlet. I hope they're picking up pen and paper or, you know, learning monologues in their homes and finding yeah. ways to, finding ways to create. Oh, you're so right. Um, and, and just to, you know, on, um, in that moment, um, Victoria Veneer, it's a good friend, um, and I wrote that song and, and she pretty much instigated, because I think I'd, I don't know, I made a comment about, you know, in the moments they sometimes come up and, and we wrote that. And that was um, every year. And I think this year was the first year I kind of did it on February, you know, in February, I usually do something that kind of, kind of correlates with that. And, and that's what you saw. It was a group of friends sitting around and we just did acoustically that song. And, mm -hmm. and then I decided to put it down. And I, I have had um, many people um, talk about that song and how it says what they want to say, you know, in, in so many ways about, especially if they've lost somebody or something, I'm like, so thank you. And I think um, it's, <laughs> that's crazy. And, and for me, <laughs> I think I'm hoping it's touching people, but thank you for that. Um, you know, and, you know, it, it's, it's so easy to say, keep following your dreams. And, and you think about, and you do, you have to follow your dreams, your passion, what you feel. But man, I know this time is kind of hard to think how that can even happen. But it's just like you said, if you use this time to pick up that pen and write, if you use this time to, to learn, and, and it's everything you're hearing, but if you're not putting it in motion, I mean, I'm going to be honest. It takes me, I mean, I stay, I'm a busy body, but for me to motivate myself has been, it gets hard. <laughs> you know, I can motivate someone else. You know, I love to inspire other people and, hey, you need to be doing this and that, but to do it for yourself is hard. Is. So when it gets, when you're isolating yourself or when you're quarantining and then, and you're scared to go out or you're, whatever you're feeling, if you can just take one little thing that you can learn, you know, is it writing a paragraph? Is it, hey, I've been wanting to write a song. Look up, look up songwriters. There's so many things on, um, on the inter internet that you can find. There's communities of people you can learn from. You can, you can find it. And um, it, is, it is so important because our mental state gets kind of weird, you know, and if you're a performer too, um, especially people that are physical a lot. That's why, you know, keep working out, <laughs> keep moving because it's, it's, um, it really does help you mentally um, because this is a hard time for all of us. You know, um, I'm in a, in a company and we're, we're trying our, our best to, to stand by on projects that we've had that because of the way of the world, I mean, if you're doing cruise ship work, you can't get on the cruise ship. If you're opening a show somewhere, they're not opening. So it's the, it's the same thing there. So individually, 
I think for me, trying to figure out a way to, to connect to what my passion is and good grief became one of those things. Mm -hmm. And from this, I've started just, you know, you get all these other ideas, share them too. share them with people that you, 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 um, I don't know, you want to be inspired by as well that you, you, you want to collaborate with and don't limit yourself to who that is. That's true. You know, just reach out to them. What's the worst? They don't reach back out. You know, you can learn a lot. And, and, um, that's really important. It's, it's so hard to keep yourself up. Um, but it's just what you said. If you can just take that day, take that hour and just go, what am I going to do right now? What am I going to learn? You know, that I thought about. I think, I think that's one reason fear is a big thing about wanting to try to find a way and share it. That's how I have been with, with my writing. And that's one reason I started the blog. I mean, I've always, I've always have written things, but I've always kept them to myself. And uh, a high school friend told me, said, what happened to all that writing and said, why don't you just start a blog? So, and, and I can relate to the fear of putting it out there. But before we wrap up, uh, me too. <laughs> I want. I wanted to talk. I wanted to ask you about what the foundation just did. I thought that was beautiful. Uh, mm. The letter that went out, and y'all were helping some of the artists during the pandemic. And how can people help with the foundation? Woo. Um, that's awesome. Thank you for even saying that. Um, the Joy Floyd Foundation. It went up that year um, in 2016, and it um, started. Um, give scholarships to like the high school that he went to. We've been given two scholarships to people um, that want to continue in the arts of whatever kind. And um, so we've been doing that every year. And I really do want to get more instrumental in it because I think sometimes we do that. And then it's kind of like, Oh, we, I want to keep evolving it. What else can we do for people? And so when the pandemic hit, I, um, Joey's sister, my sister-in-law, Jill um, and I, and um we were talking and I'm like, what, what do we have to give? You know? So we picked about, I, I was able to gift at least about 10 to 12 people. Um, just a, a small amount, but to help with, with anything, hey, it helps. you know? And I just, I think that was, it was, it's been interesting. It was really laid on my heart big time to be able to help. And I went, I have joy Floyd foundation. You know, and I, um, I would say if you could just go and like the page and uh, we are still planning to do, um, you know, it's usually in Texas, we've been having festivals and stuff, but this year we obviously are not yet, but there will be some things coming up that, um, I would love to get other people involved in and, and music wise and, and, um, but it's Joy Floyd Foundation is just on Facebook right now. And, uh, thanks for asking because we want to help those in the arts. I want to get you here to do something. Um, ah, I love it. I, I want I want you to come and do something when it's safe. And we'll definitely can talk about that now that people down here can see and know who you are. Yeah. And I've introduced your music to several people. So um, hopefully you can come and do something with us. Um, you know, Lauren should pop back on here. I think we're going to wrap up. Um, I can't say anything but thank you. As I said, uh, this is this has been really nice. I know Lauren has been looking for uh, ways. Lauren has been so great about putting the arts in the forefront here in the Triangle. And the day I was listening to Blank Canvas, I said I can interview Lauren for RDU on stage and talk about the journey that she's gone. If you were willing and you said yes, let's do it. So of course, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I love this interview so much. I love this chat. I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot. And um, now it makes me want to come back to Nashville. And and now I have a friend there. Now I can visit Miss yes. <laughs> Lauren <Ford. laughs> Um, Thank you, Tim, for doing this. And thank you, thank you. for spending the time. This was wonderful. Um, you, you, one of your fans online, Vanessa said, you are such an amazing and talented human. So I have to agree. <laughs> oh, that was very sweet. Thanks, Vanessa. <laughs> and, um, if you joined us late, you can, um, check it out on 
Facebook. It'll live on the Argue On Stage Facebook page. In a few days, it'll be on our website. And thank you again for doing this. I really appreciate it, both thank of you. Thank y'all. My you. pleasure. And I do hope that I can come and see y'all. We'll do make something. it happen. We, we will make it happen. Remember, this is just intermission for us. So. <laughs> Yes. Awesome. So thank you so much again. Thank, thank you. you both and stay safe and healthy. Tim, I will see you soon. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.